the Gospel of John, and it's one of my favorite things that, uh, that Jesus says. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will ask the Father, and he will send another companion who will be with you forever. This companion is the spirit of truth whom the world can't recognize because it neither sees him nor recognizes him. You know him because he lives with you and will be with you. I won't leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You will live too. So ends the reading of God's holy word. Please stand and join in singing the same and Get started on uh, today's message. It's on. It's on. Are you coming through? Yeah. All right. Usually Bonnie's trying to get me to turn it off. That's why I was confused. Oh. <laughs> Before we get started on, uh, on today's message, uh, could the veterans please stand up for a second? Danny and Tim and Don, David. Let's give a great big hand. Thank you guys. Uh, we can't thank you enough for everything that you have done and what you've given to this country and um, very much appreciate it. Thank you. Well, it was um, during the 17th century in the court of King Charles I. Of course, the, uh, the country is England. And during this time period, uh, a most remarkable night of all the statesmen that were present in uh, King Charles's court, this one particular night stood out above the rest. His name was, uh, after he became a knight, his name was Sir Geoffrey Hudson. Anybody hear of Sir Geoffrey Hudson? No? All right. Well, his deeds of valor, his exciting lifestyle of romance and adventure are just a matter of record. Every story of Jeffrey's wild life is believed to be quite true. All those stories are quite wild and full of bravery and romance and are found to be as true as anything else that was recorded during that time period. All of Jeffrey's perils, however, um, of all of Jeffrey's perils, there was one adventure in particular from which Sir Jeffrey narrowly escaped with his life. While he had um, easily survived in the fields of battle and the fields of honor and even several, too many to actually count, jealous husbands. Um, what had happened then to uh, Jeffrey was kind of an ordinary thing, striking a very unordinary kind of person. Sir Jeffrey almost lost his life because of drowning. It was the closest that he had ever come to death closer to death in drowning than he was in any of the battles that he fought in in the field. Now, without giving you all of Sir Jeffrey's history, because that would take a, a pretty good chunk of time, here is just kind of a short summary of his life. When he was just nine years old, he was taken into service 
of the Duke and Duchess of Buckingham Palace. There he was trained and later to be presented to the King and to the Queen of England. In those early years, Geoffrey became a diplomat for the British Diplomatic Service. During a trip to, uh, to France one time, his voyage was interrupted by a group of pirates. It was during his captivity that he began to show exactly what he was made of. He began to show his bravery and the fact that he had a fearsome courage to stand up to anybody that got in his way, especially the pirates. Now by the year 1637, reports of Geoffrey's valor reached England just about a year later. At the young age of 19, Geoffrey was greeted as a hero in his hometown. He was soon knighted Sir Geoffrey Hudson. The ladies soon began to fight for his attention. From that time until the day that he died, he experienced an incredible succession of romantic episodes, duels to the death, unjust imprisonment and escape, and world travel and battles with countless pirates. The years went by, and as the years passed, Sir Geoffrey bravely added to his reputation in love and in war until he reached the ripe old age of 60 when he decided to retire. Now the question you may have at this time is, how could such a brave individual, a great lover, be so clumsy as to have a near drowning experience and death? You see, Sir Geoffrey almost drowned as he was beginning to wash his face and hands in the wash basin. You see, life uh, is like that for all of us. If we do not or cannot see the big picture that surrounds our life experiences, then we just simply do not know all that we really need to know. But the good news is we know someone who does know everything. We tend to have a very tough time trusting that individual, trusting God. The fact that God does see everything and the fact that God is dealing with the big picture. God asks us to trust him with the big picture picture and that is why we know and strongly believe in our Romans 828 quote paraphrased says that God works all things together for the good of those who love him it is the very concept that this week's message as we look at our movie series based on the movie, The Shack. This week we see Mac, the main character, the father, getting very angry with God because God did not stop and prevent the kidnapping and the murder of his daughter, Missy. Clearly, it is incredibly difficult to trust God to handle the situation when really all that we feel is our pain. 
Well, let's take a look at the clip, and then we will talk about it, and we'll see some. Of, uh, take a look at some of the concepts that come forth uh, as Mac is interacting with God and then interacting with the Holy Spirit and how Mac needs to look at the big picture. So Drew, if we could have that. Yeah. 
And you can see how Max cannot uh, see the big picture because he's right there in the middle of it. But we do see what the big picture is like as the, as the camera goes back. It wasn't that long ago that we uh, spent quite a bit of time uh, analyzing and looking at uh, Romans 8.28. If you recall, we used the metaphor of uh, my mother making a cake from scratch and when she was making that if I went in and tried to taste one of the ingredients say uh, vanilla for example by itself vanilla is quite bitter it's just it's not good now the same can be said uh, Gene for sugar uh, by itself it sugar is is pretty sweet you mix everything together however, then it tastes really good. It becomes what it was intended to become. Now, the same is true when we can only see one tiny portion of what God has put together for us. As he strings all things together, he is seeing the big picture, something that we are incapable of of seeing but we are asked to trust God for what he is doing in our lives now back to our, our clip um, the uh, time that Mac is spending in the garden here is is with the character that actually represents the Holy Spirit uh, the pronunciation of her name uh, I'm gonna butcher so it's a uh, Seriu something like that means uh, wind and it's referring to the wind um, 
that uh, the Gospel of John talks about at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes in. So, once again, uh, as the camera comes out, you can see the big picture that God is working with, and then we just have to trust him that what he's doing is the right thing. Now, the further away the camera gets, the better the garden looks. Clearly, life is actually like that for us. We can see from our narrow, very narrow perspective um, that it's not only uh, uh, close to being a complete view as we see when we are able to see something the way that God sees it from a distance. Now, did you notice the discussion that Mac is having with the Holy Spirit regarding the poisonous root that they uncovered? How deadly that root was. And how Mac's reaction to that, of course, was get rid of it. Just take it out. And don't we do that sometimes when we feel that there's something toxic going on in our lives? We want God to take it away, to remove it. But then as she points out, when it's mixed with a flowering plant, it is an incredible healing solution. So good can be drawn out of that which is bad or perceived as bad. Now, let's spend just a few more moments uh, talking about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit acts in your life. It's been said that the Holy Spirit is the bridge to God within you. It is the part of your mind, the part of your spirit that is joined with the mind of God. Now, as we've said before, um, as you look at the triune God, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, each of those entities are equally powerful, and each of those entities, of course, is God. Now, the Holy Spirit is equal with the Father, as we said, and the Son of God. He is present in the world to make us aware of our need for Christ in our lives. And he provides to us the power and the ingredients that it takes for us to live Christ-like, which is what we're all commanded to do. The Holy Spirit was given to each of God's children and given by God. It was put inside of every one of us. Now he is a part of them. The Holy Spirit is a part of you. Now the words, uh, the perspective, and the love that comes through the Holy Spirit is a reassurance and a promise that our own um, restoration will one day be complete. And so there's a lot of hope that the Holy Spirit brings into our lives. I mentioned the scripture that Body read, and one of my favorite things that Jesus said to me is just full of hope when Christ said, I will not leave you as orphans. We are not going to be left alone. We will have the Holy Spirit within us. And the Holy Spirit becomes very active the precise moment that you believe. The precise moment of your salvation is when the Holy Spirit is activated. Now, it was quite some time after that that we uh, looked at Galatians and how Galatians, uh, by Paul, 
uh, gave us a description of the fruits of the Spirit. You may recall the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Nine of them. Fruits of the Spirit. And God knows it takes a while in order for those to kick in our lives. Your salvation occurs immediately. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit within you is immediate. But the fruits of the Spirit come over time as we learn to live Christ-like. Now, we could spend, uh, gosh, a lot more time on the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit can change us. But it's time that we uh, went back and looked at our brave knight. Sir Geoffrey Hudson almost lost his life by drowning in a very small wash basin. Whenever we look at the bravery of Sir Geoffrey Hudson, we should also look at how he almost died in his own wash basin. Not because uh, he was necessarily careless and somehow became unconscious, unconscious with his head falling into the, the basin. It should be noted that uh, back during the 17th century in the king's court, it was fairly common for the king's court to have one of these. And Sir Geoffrey Hudson was indeed one of those. The king's court of the mid 17th century has one of these on staff. And in this case, it was Sir Geoffrey. You see, the king's court of that day did employ Sir Geoffrey Hudson as the court's dwarf. Sir Geoffrey was a mere 18 inches tall. Amen. We'd have our ushers come forward, please. Mm-hmm. 